welcome to this tutorial on severity criteria. John Wagoner will join us here in a moment to discuss what will be the first of two installments on the topic. But before we begin, just a few announcements. If you have any questions that might come up about today's topic, or if you need to contact us, please feel free to reach out to the Infrared Training Center directly. You can call us at 1-866-872-4647 or via email at info at infraredtraining.com. The Infrared Training Center website is where you'll find additional free tutorials as well as our complete global training schedule for certification classes that are available worldwide. Now, this includes ASNT-based levels 1, 2, and 3, as well as an ISO-based Category 1 course that is now available. Head to InfraredTraining.com to learn more. And while you're online, be sure to get social with the Infrared Training Center. We're very active on these channels, so be sure to follow us on X, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, where you'll find helpful tips, thermal imaging best practices, special training offers, and much more. Speaking of special training offers, I should mention that the Infrared Training Center also runs a number of promotions throughout the year. So if you're looking to get certified, there's never been a better time with great deals available that will benefit both you and your thermography program. To learn more about these, please feel free to give us a call, send us an email, or visit the Infrared Training Center online at infraredtraining.com. All right, let's get right to it with John Wagoner. John is a senior instructor and level three master thermographer. Today he's going to discuss severity criteria as it applies to electrical thermography. Enjoy the presentation. Welcome to the Infrared Training Center and our ongoing webinar series. In this webinar, we'll discuss severity criteria and how it applies to electrical thermography. My name is John Wagner. I'm a senior instructor for the Infrared Training Center. I've spent the last 37 years in the electrical and mechanical fields with an emphasis upon installation, testing, maintenance, and troubleshooting of these types of equipment. As a part of all this testing and maintenance, I've also spent 32 of these 37 years uh, using infrared thermographic cameras. In fact, uh, all the cameras that you see pictured here on this slide, I've used in my career. Our objectives in this webinar are to define criteria and provide some examples of criteria as we open up this discussion. Take a look at the factors that influence all types of criteria. There are several factors that need to be considered when using any type of criteria. Another aspect of talking about criteria is looking at qualitative versus quantitative thermography. So we'll define those and give you some examples of both. Anytime we talk about criteria, we also have to talk about direct versus indirect thermography. So we'll define and discuss both of them. And we wanna look at differences between direct and indirect, but also similarities when you're performing both types of thermography. Find baseline thermography and identify how it can be used in different approaches to applying criteria. And then finally, we're going to put it all together. How do we use all this information as we examine and analyze thermal images of electrical equipment? It's a lengthier part, so we'll ask you to be patient with us because we're going to do this part or this portion of the webinar in the second part of this webinar series. So criteria, right from the dictionary, a principle or standard by which something may be judged or decided. So let's give you a couple of examples. Example number one, we'll ask the question, how do you know if your tires are over or under inflated. So if you pull out a pressure gauge and you check the pressure of your tires, you're still not going to know offhand whether it's too much or too little. And so if you look at the sidewall of the tire or go to the owner's manual for the printed data, it'll tell you what the recommended pressure is for the tires on your vehicle. 
Our second example of criteria is how do you know if you have an abnormal body temperature? So according to the Mayo Clinic, you can use a uh, oral thermometer uh, or a mouth thermometer. And if you measure a temperature that's 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 37.8 degrees Celsius or higher, uh, then you have what, what's commonly referred to as either a temperature or a fever. So a third example would be taken from the NIDA slash NFPA 70B criteria table. So NIDA, National Electrical Testing Association, and NFPA, National Fire Protection Association 70B. Both of these are recommended maintenance standards by these uh, uh, organizations. Now you'll notice in the first two columns, what we want to just identify here is, is that they're identifying electrical problems based on a temperature difference or what we commonly refer to as a delta T. All we want to do is identify that here's criteria that can be used to either judge or identify a potential problem. Now, when we get into the second part of this webinar, we're going to dig deeper into uh, these types of criteria and demonstrate how to use them and talk about both their strengths and their weaknesses. Finally, one last example, uh, manufacturer's temperature rating. Again, I want to emphasize what's in the red. Uh, this is uh, table 310.20 from the National Electrical Code. And you'll notice the title, Ampacities of Conductors. And we're not going to really discuss the ampacities. In the red, you'll notice, though, that for different categories of electrical conductor, there is a criteria for the maximum temperature that the conductor's allowed to operate at. And, and so we'll discuss again using this as a part of our criteria later in part two. But again, another example of a temperature criteria or a criteria. So our first factor that influences criteria is load, or if we put it in other terms, current load. It is one of the more important factors that influence criteria. Our second factor that influences criteria is equipment designation. You could also think of this as criticality. How critical is the equipment? Our third factor is circuit designation. And again, how critical is the electrical circuit that feeds a group or even a single piece of electrical equipment? Our fourth and final factor that influences criteria is heat transfer effects. So as we talk about load, we just want to remind everyone that we're talking about electrical current or what is commonly referred to as amps on the circuit or electrical equipment under examination. We also want to be reminded that the National Fire Protection Association Standard 70B, which is about electrical maintenance, recommends that when doing infrared thermography, there be a minimum of 40% load per electrical equipment rating. Why is load important? Well, too little load and there won't be enough heat. Remember, an FPA 70B says 40% of equipment rating. The infrared image in front of you is one of a three phase multi case circuit breaker. And you'll notice that we're measuring on two of the conductors the temperature. And if you look at the temperature, 70.7 and 70.9, they're very equivalent, but also very low, right around room temperature. Uh, the thermographer who took this image was new to thermography and was looking for help and asking why he couldn't really see any heat on the conductors. Well, turns out that the breaker was on, but no load was uh, being pulled through the, the conductors. In other words, nothing was operating. And so this can be a struggle if we don't have enough load. We can't see anything. Now notice we're going to go on the other side of this discussion. Again, we're asking the question, why is this important? Here is a three phase fuse block and you'll notice that the center phase is warmer than the two outside phases. Uh, 
We can go traditionally with phase A, B, and C left to right, or L1, L2, L3 left to right. But L2, or phase B, is warmer. There is no problem here, though, because it was simply a load issue. The center phase, phase B, or L2, simply had slightly more load than the two outside phases, A and C, L1, L3, uh, than uh, they had. And so you got to be careful because, you see, load is so very important in diagnosing thermal issues. One of the best ways to think about load is to try to image your electrical components or equipment when operating normally. That could be 40% load, that could be 80% load, or somewhere in between. But that's the best approach to being able to see if you have heat problems with electrical equipment is to examine it when it's operating normally. So we want to look at equipment and circuit designation, another factor influencing criteria. Now this one is, is a little bit less with the camera and more basically at looking at the site that you're working in. We got to ask this question, is the equipment critical or is it non-critical? It's a very important uh, question to ask because it will influence how we treat thermal anomalies that we find. This applies not only to the equipment, but also to electrical circuits that supply the operation. We could even go as far as to say that this could also be regarding medium voltage circuits that feed the building. This may involve determining locations of equipment within a facility or multiple facilities. It would definitely include counting out how many pieces of electrical equipment are we going to be looking at and designating them with either a, uh, either a scale of criticality or a critical non-critical designation. Uh, One-line diagrams, if they're up to date, can be very ha handy. And also, uh, just company employee knowledge can be just uh, even better than all the other things I just mentioned. Uh, an employee um, uh, within the facility that's been there for some time can talk about critical equipment. They can talk about critical circuits. And so uh, this is more of a fact-finding mission than it is actually using the camera, per se. One last comment that we'd like to make about equipment and circuit designation or criticality is thinking about your criteria. Criteria on important equipment or critical equipment may need to be more stringent, tighter than other pieces of equipment that do not fall into that same classification. As we continue our discussion regarding factors influencing criteria, we want to talk now about heat transfer effects. What we're really talking about is, there, is there any part of the equipment that has some type of added cooling effect as it works? So think of, for instance, uh, your car, and you have a radiator on the front of your car, you have what, what most people refer to as a water pump that pumps the coolant around your engine. And so what we're saying here is, is if you have equipment that you're analyzing with thermography and it has things like a heat exchanger or a radiator or a pump or a fan, you need to make sure that that equipment also is working properly. So here's a good example of what we're talking about. This is what we call a power transformer. This is in the Southwest United States. Uh, this is an image that was provided to us uh, with the question, why the heat exchanger or the radiator by the white arrow uh, was very cool. You can see the central part of the transformer is very warm. And there's liquid in that transformer tank that circulates through that heat exchanger and is cooled by flowing through, but also notice there are fans blowing air across the tubes of this exchanger uh, or radiator. There's also down in the very bottom center, a pump that helps to circulate the liquid in the transformer 
through the radiator or heat exchanger. Now, that thermal pattern is very irregular, and without going too deep into the analysis of the problem, what they had was is they had a pumping issue. Uh, the pump that had been provided by the manufacturer when the transformer was shipped brand new was not the correct speed pump. In other words, you can have pumps that pump just correctly the amount of liquid or fluid through the heat exchanger or radiator, but you can also have problems with pumps that pump too fast or pump too slowly. In this case, the pump was running way too fast. And so what was happening was, is the heated liquid was being pulled through the first couple of sections of the heat exchanger, but not allowing the liquid to get completely into all of the tubes and therefore be cooled properly. This is why the transformer was running too hot. Now let's continue with our discussion about heat transfer effects, but now let's look at the environment. Is there anything in the environment where the equipment sits that is abnormal? And we're really, we say heating and cooling here, and that could be the effect, but most of the time it's a heating issue that we're concerned about. Again, let's look at an example of a heat transfer effect that was affecting motor operation. This is a uh, food production plant and it's in a building where they do the final mix of the food product and put it into a oven, huge oven, and cook it. There are 16 motors that are mixing the final food product. Each motor is the same horsepower, 250 horsepower. The oven, which is right next to where the motors are doing the final mixing, runs at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Now the motors are running hot and they're experiencing motor failure every one to two years. So there is a huge turnover of motors in this building on a regular basis. Now what you have before you is a drawing same example I just introduced you to. You can see the 16 blue blocks, which are just the motors and the mixers they're attached to. Notice in the center uh, between uh, the top eight motors and the bottom eight motors, there's a conveyor. And the conveyor goes down between both sides of uh, both motors. So you have eight motors on one side of the conveyor and eight motors on the other side of the conveyor. And the motors, once they mix the product, are dumping their product onto the conveyor. And the conveyor carries the food into the oven where it cooks and then comes out and goes on to packaging. Now, first of all, look at the top left of my slide. The inside air temperature is 105 degrees Fahrenheit. And then notice the dashed box around the inside eight motors. These motors are particularly running much warmer. They're trapped and there's very poor airflow. And because of the oven operating in the same room as the motors mixing the food, there is a severe heating problem that puts a certain amount of stress on the motors right out of the starting gate. And this explains why motors are not running as long as they ought to. It explains why motors are failing every one to two years. And yet the people working in this room of the building uh, were totally oblivious to all of the things that were sort of contributing to the overheating. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because standard criteria here for motors and for bearings uh, would be hard to apply because of the very harsh heating environment in which they work. Now, let's move on from factors that uh, affect your criteria to another uh, question about your thermography that impacts how you perform your criteria, and that is qualitative thermography versus quantitative thermography. Uh, note below, qualitative thermography is where you're taking a thermal image and you're analyzing it to determine if there's a problem. The only things that the thermographer really needs to 
uh, pay attention to is to properly focus the image uh, to verify that he's in the correct temperature range. And that's really for thermal tuning purposes. And also to be close enough to the image so that there's enough pixels from the detector on the target that provides for good or adequate analysis. So continuing on with qualitative, uh, we kind of mentioned this already, but when you're performing qualitative analysis, uh, you're going to have to thermally tune, manually adjust your span and level. In other words, adjust the thermal contrast and brightness of the image. And then finally, you'll take use of either on the camera or in the software, different types of color palettes to assist with analyzing that thermal image. Uh, so here's an example of what we're talking about. This is a manufacturing process that is looking right now, the thermographer is looking at a fuse block, three phase. And if you look at the left, he's taken the image in what we call automatic mode. Remember that automatic mode in the thermal camera is where the camera firmware will look at all the radiation data that it sees and will adjust the span and level or contrast and brightness to give you the what they think is the best quality picture. Now, we can see, if you look down below at the bottom of the fuse block, we can see that the A phase or line one on the left is brighter than the other two phases. When we look though at the same image, notice what we've done. We've done two things. We've uh, thermally tuned it a little bit differently. And we've also changed from the iron bow palette to the rainbow palette. Now, uh, look at the bottom of the A phase or line one conductor at the bottom of the image. And as you look at that, you can see that there is a thermal problem that exists, not in the fuse block itself, but in something below it that's not in view. And that's because we have what's called a thermal gradient. So I want to make a few other comments here before we move on to quantitative. This type of analysis, qualitative, is really dependent upon how, how well you take your thermographic image. Notice qualitatively, we're not using any temperature. We're only making sure that we're in focus and in the correct range and close enough so that we get a good image of the target. And then we're going to use the thermal tuning and palette tools, either on the camera or in the software, to analyze the image. Notice we cannot speak to severity. We can say once we thermally tuned it and changed the palettes on the right, we can say that there's definitely a problem there. Uh, but we can't, without doing further analysis, we, we would only say there's a problem in, and have to say that we need to make a repair. That's what we would do qualitatively. And so it becomes somewhat of a criteria in and of itself. And many thermographers do use this approach. So now we want to move on to quantitative thermography. Quantitative is related to qualitative. In fact, if you want to do quantitative thermography, you have to do everything that you do in qualitative. You need to focus, you need to be in the correct temperature range, you need to be close enough to the target to make a measurement now. And that's the real difference, is in quantitative thermography, we're gonna take temperature measurements and typically also take temperature difference measurements or what is commonly referred to as delta Ts. So quantitatively, we have an example right here of two pillow block bearings on a large rotating process. This is out of the copper mining industry. Now you can see visually or qualitative that the bearing on the left is warmer from uh, the radiation image that we see compared to the pillow block bearing on the right. But now what we've done is we've added three things. We've added a measurement of each bearing, and then we've taken the temperature difference or delta T 
between those two bearings. And you can see that the box one, which is on the left, uh, is measuring just a little over 222 degrees Fahrenheit or 105.6 degrees Celsius. And then on the right, box two is reporting 194.7 degrees Fahrenheit and 90.4 degrees Celsius. And that gives us a delta T, you can see, of 27.5 Fahrenheit versus 15.3 Celsius. Now, here's the thing. We need some other data. We need to know what the emissivity of the surface of the pillow block bearings are. We might even need to measure reflected apparent temperature or background temperature, depending on what model camera you're using. These, there's other data that might need to be collected to help verify that these temperatures are accurate. This is another way to approach criteria, to measure temperatures, to look at delta T. There's other data that needs to also be gathered. And so uh, we're going to talk more about this in the second part, but we want to understand first and foremost the difference between qualitative image-only analysis and quantitative where we're analyzing the image but also collecting data, temperatures, delta T, where we're thinking about things like emissivity, reflected temperature. We might even be including some other types of measurements uh, that we would measure alongside. Think about this motor here. Uh, we might want to look at its lubrication schedule to see how frequently or infrequently uh, the bearings have been lubricated. Uh, it might require that the alignment be analyzed. It might be required uh, that a vibration tool uh, be placed on the rotating equipment to verify that the rotation in the X, Y, and Z axes is within tolerances. So. Uh, this is where we get into uh, being a bit more detailed when we get into quantitative analysis of images. As I wrap up this portion, qualitative versus quantitative, I just want to lay it all out in front of you so you can see it all in one place. Qualitative is image-only analysis. You're looking at radiation differences. Your concern as a thermal camera operator is to be in focus and to be in the correct temperature range, uh, to be close enough to the target so that we can put a maximum amount of pixels on the target for analysis, uh, to practice thermal tuning, manually adjusting the span and level, the thermal contrast and brightness, and finally, uh, to work with the palettes to see what gives you the best coloring as you do your analysis. Looking on the right, again, quantitatively, we're going to do everything that the qualitative thermographer does, but now we're going to add to it the measurement of temperature and temperature differences or delta Ts. Uh, we're going to do the thermal tuning and we're going to possibly change palettes, but notice the last two points. We need to think about emissivity and reflective apparent temperature or background temperature. And we might even need to think about the atmosphere and how to compensate for it between the camera and the target. Now these are, this is another part of looking at criteria and how we analyze a thermal image. So as we move on, we also, as we talk about criteria, we have to ask the question, Am I imaging a direct or an indirect target? And so notice we call this direct versus indirect thermography. Direct thermography says that we're imaging and the camera detector can quote unquote see where the heat is being produced. So take a look at this image that we did have on the previous slide. Uh, this is a contactor, three-phase, along with a set of overloads uh, just to the right of the contactor. 
we have some heat that appears to be building up on the phase A or line one conductor. And notice from the bottom of the contactor over to the thermal overloads, you'll notice that as we move from the lug at the bottom of the contactor, that the heat decreases as we move away from the connection. Now, we need to talk about many things in the second part, but right now notice we're using temperature to compare the phase A or line one con uh, conductor next to uh, the conductor in the middle phase, line two, phase B. Both of these measurements are on the electrical conductors and are considered to be direct temperature measurements. In other, in, in other words, the heat that the camera is seeing and measuring is direct. We're seeing the source of the heat. Now, why is that? This is an insulated conductor, but it turns out that due to the manufacturing process of molding the insulation over the conductor, that it is so tight that there's no difference between the outside of the insulation and inside where the conductor is. Direct. We can see the source of the heat. So what's indirect thermography? Notice infrared imaging where the camera detector cannot quote unquote see where the heat is being produced. And let's take a look at this image in a little bit more detail. So notice indirect thermography, the infrared image that you see is one of what's called a load break elbow. We find this in pad mount utility switches and also pad mount utility transformers. This is the high voltage side of the connections. And right now, we just want you to understand, there's, again, there's more to talk about in the second part, but you'll notice that the middle phase, phase B line two, is warmer than both phase A, which is above, and phase C, which is below. And we actually, show you the temperature on the middle phase as being 133 degrees Fahrenheit or 56 degrees Celsius. Now, the insulation uh, that covers the mechanical parts of this elbow is very thick. In fact, so thick that it's estimated that the increase of temperature on the inside of this insulation is somewhere between two to three times higher in temperature than what is measured on the outside. In other words, when we talk about indirect thermography, there is some type of insulation between what we're measuring on the outside and where the true heat is being produced on the inside. Uh, down at the bottom of our text here, we tell you that there are many electrical and mechanical loads that are considered to be indirect. This list is not exhaustive, but look at it. Breakers, contactors, enclosed bus duct motors, bearings, liquid-filled components like liquid-filled transformers, liquid-filled uh, circuit breakers, voltage regulators, just to name a few of the more common types of equipment. That means that criteria has to be very different when we talk about doing indirect thermography and doing direct thermography. The last major topic that we want to address in this webinar is baseline thermography. Baseline thermography is when you take a thermal image. We say here an initial or first thermal image. It's when it's operating normally, usually when it's been newly installed or just repaired after a thermal anomaly. And then we save this image and we use this image as a comparison or baseline for all future thermal imaging of this target. Uh, please note that you can do this type of thermography, baseline thermography, qualitatively or quantitatively. So we can use images for comparison or we can use temperatures for future comparison also. So here's an example. 
uh, a brand new blower mo motor. And this is courtesy of one of our students at the Infrared Training Center. Brand new, large blower motor has been installed. Uh, the, the blower motor has been allowed uh, to operate for a period of time uh, between one to two hours. This allows the motor uh, to heat up and to get operating and to create adequate thermal patterns on the outside of the motor. One side comment, this motor that you see in the image, both visually and thermally, uh, this is all indirect. The bearings and the case of the motor, all the thermal imaging that we do here is of an indirect nature, which means that any criteria that we would apply qualitatively or quantitatively would have to be very tight, very strict because small temperature changes on the outside indicate very large temperature changes on the inside. So this is a good example of how do you begin. This image now is what is used, whether it's just comparing images or whether it's just uh, using temperatures off of the initial image and comparing it to future images of the same target. Now. Uh, we need to talk some more about baseline thermography. Uh, if you're going to do this qualitatively, you have to use identical palettes. You have to uh, thermally tune identically. It's very important that the environmental conditions and load conditions of your product be very close from the initial image to say year one or year two when another image is taken. Really this applies also quantitatively if we're taking temperature measurements and delta T measurements or temperature difference measurements. We still need to have similar loading. We need to have similar environmental conditions like air temperature, humidity. Uh, we need to take images at similar angles so there is some detail to doing baseline thermography. Now, as we close out this part of criteria, as we do electrical thermography, let's put it all together just for a big wide view so that we can also be prepared for the next webinar. Remember, we're trying to talk about how we do analysis of our electrical thermal imaging. We talked about how you can look at things qualitatively and quantitatively. Now, if you look on the left side, qualitatively, really we have to distinguish between only direct versus indirect thermography. And then we have to ask the question, are we going to analyze the image based on any baseline data that we've taken previously? Or are we just going to make a determination of our electrical product based on the current image that we take. That's the yes or no under baseline. And so that there's not much that goes into qualitative in terms of other data, although remember load is important. And we'll talk more about load and how it factors in to our baselining in the next episode. On the right side, we have quantitative. And again, we have to ask the question, as we measure our temperatures and our temperature differences, are we looking at direct or indirect products? Can we directly see the heat or is there a sizable amount of insulation that covers the heat so that we only see small increases of temperature on the surface? Either way, the next question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we going to use published criteria? Remember, criteria is a, a, a principle or a standard that we're going to use to make a judgment on something. And we talked about some examples like tire pressure and body temperature and other things earlier in this webinar. Or are we going to create our own criteria by baselining our temperatures? And that is possible doing electrical thermography. Now, we want to thank you for joining us and it's been a pleasure to have you and please stay tuned for part two.
Remember, if you have any questions on today's topic, please feel free to reach out to the Infrared Training Center directly. You can call us at 1-866-872-4647 or via email at info at infraredtraining.com. Our website is where you'll also find free tutorials on a variety of topics, plus our complete training schedule. Uh, speaking of which, if you're ready to get certified, we also run a number of special training offers throughout the year. To learn more, give us a call or visit the Infrared Training Center online at infraredtraining.com. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you online again soon.